Okay, so now the story, the narrative shifts. We're going to go ahead and read this, but that, that portion caps off Hannah's great trial of barrenness, God's blessing of the boy Samuel, Samuel's dedication to the work of the Lord, and now Elkanah and his wives, Hannah being one of them, go home, and yet Samuel remains with the priest. Now we begin to learn a little bit more about Eli's family. And as we read this, the, the, the way, the tone that this is going to take on is kind of one of those, one of those really cheesy 1980s films where, where the montage keeps changing. We're going we're gonna to see Eli's sons, then we're going to see Samuel, then it's back to Eli's sons, and then it's back to Samuel. And there's going to be this contrast that will naturally arise from that. So let's take a look now at this text in verse, starting at verse 12, reading now to the end of the chapter. Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. Now we know that's fairly precarious when you're in the profession of ministry. The custom of the priests with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant would come while the meat was boiling with a three-pronged fork in his hand and he would thrust it into the pan or the kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is what they did at Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Moreover, before the fat was burned, the priest's servant would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, give meat for the priest to roast for he will not accept boiled meat from you but only raw. And if the man said to him, let them burn the fat first and then take as much as you wish. He would say, no, you must give it now. And if not, I'll take it by force. Thus, the sin of the young man was very great in the sight of the Lord. For the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a, a boy clothed with a linen ephod, and his mother used to make for him a, a little robe and take it to him each year when she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Then Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, May the Lord give you children by this woman for the petition she asked of the Lord. So then they would return to their home. Indeed, the Lord visited Hannah, she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters, and the boy Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord. Right? Montage. Now back. Now we're back to Eli and his worthless sons. Now Eli was very old, verse 22, and he kept hearing all that his sons were doing to all Israel, and how they lay with the women who were serving at the entrance to the tent of the meeting. And he said to them, why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all these people. No, my sons, it is, it is no good report that I, hear, that I hear the people of the Lord spreading abroad. If someone sins against man, God will mediate for him. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? But they would not listen to the voice of their father, for it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. Now the boy Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favor with the Lord and also with man. So we've now jostled again. Eli's sons, Samuel. Eli's sons, Samuel. Now the last and the concluding portion of our chapter here together this evening. Verse 27. And there came a man of God to Eli and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Did I indeed reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt, subject to the house of Pharaoh? Did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest and to go up to my altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? I gave to the house of your father all my offerings by fire from the people of Israel. Why then do they scorn my sacrifices and my offerings that I commanded for my dwelling and honor your sons above me by fattening themselves on the choicest parts of every offering of my people Israel. Therefore the Lord God of Israel declares, I promise that your house and the house of your father should go in and out before me forever. But now the Lord declares, far be it from me. For those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days are coming. When I will cut off your strength and the strength of your father's house so that there will not be an old man in your house. 
that in distress you will look with envious eye on all the prosperity that shall be bestowed on Israel, and there shall not be even an old man in your house forever. The only one of you whom I shall not cut off from my altar shall be spared to weep his eyes out to grieve his heart. And all the descendants of your house shall die by the sword of men. And this, and this that shall come upon your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, shall be the sign to you. Both of them shall die on the same day. And I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house and he shall go in and out before my anointed forever. Verse 36, And everyone who is left in your house shall come to implore him for a piece of silver or a loaf of, of a loaf of bread and shall say, Please put me in one of the priest's places that I may eat a morsel of bread. So we're speaking now about Eli and his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. And the desperate situation that arises when people who are entrusted with the ministry, entrusted with the service of God, entrusted to be faithful, abuse their position, abuse their office, abuse their opportunity. One commentator wrote this, their story, that's Eli's sons, stands as a warning to those who would treat religion as a means for manipulating others or obtaining personal gain. This is how God reacts. This is how God treats them. And now we see in our story that, that contrast, that constant bouncing back and forth between Samuel, who is the honest, the quiet, the dutiful servant in the house of the priest, and these two wretched, worthless, debased men, Hophni and Phinehas. Let's speak about Samuel. What, what do we learn about Samuel? We, we see this in the text that he was humble in his service before the Lord. Verse 18 says, Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy clothed with a linen ephod. He received each year, we learn this, he received each year, a robe from his mother. This indicates that, that Samuel wasn't raised on extravagance. No, no, he was raised with the, the bare necessities and each year he received an item of clothing that, that would serve him for the year. He's a, he's a growing boy and the next year mum would come around and bring a brand new robe for him to wear. His needs would be supplied. You see, this is a nice parenting tip right here that we all ought to take into consideration it used to be when, when, when the child would get whatever they wanted, whenever they wanted, so long as they threw a loud enough or a boisterous enough of a tantrum. It, it, it used to be called spoiling them. Not so much these days. It's pat on the back and celebrated. But it used to be called spoiling them because it, it, it literally did that. It spoiled them. It harmed them. It, it ruined them. It, it burned them. It affected them. And that's why this contrast is appearing in the text here for us this evening between Samuel, who receives little more than a robe per year. He's, he's got an ephod. He's serving the Lord, and he's, he's happy. He's happy in his circumstance. But these other, two, these other two young men, Hophni and Phinehas, can't get enough. Their insatiable appetite for more, and they're willing they are willing to sin and abuse and manipulate and take advantage to obtain what they feel like is rightfully theirs. We also read in verse 26 of 1 Samuel chapter 2. Now the boy Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favor with the Lord and also with man. Even if you don't know where this story is going, even if you've never read or, or, or been taught the story, the narrative of 1 Samuel, it's already apparent in this early chapter of the book that Eli and his sons are going to fade into the background of significance in this story. And Samuel will continue to rise before the Lord as a man used mightily in the purposes of God. There's a humility. There's a sensitivity. There's, there's a dutiful and yet quiet servant-heartedness about Samuel that now we're going to see the contrast with Eli's other sons, who we are told are worthless and they do not know the Lord. I see this in verse 17. We read about these men. We read that 
they began to treat the offering of the Lord with contempt. Now, now all that discussion about the, the meat in the pot and the boiling and the roasting, all of that by and large, unless you've studied the intricacies of that, are, are going to be well and truly lost on the majority of us. So let's spend a quick moment just explaining how this is happening. What's going on here is, is that in the times of, of Israel, in the times of the priesthood, the predominant source of the priesthood's food and daily nourishment came from people bringing sacrifices. People would bring sacrifices of, of meat and, and grain and sometimes even vegetables and, and a portion of this sacrifice would be dedicated to, to feed the priest. That was literally what they, what they lived off. That's the way it worked. But God, God had some very strict parameters about how this offering was to be contributed to the house of God and the God of the house so that it was always Apparent that when someone brings an offering to the Lord, it is principally to the Lord that they're offering to. But not Phineas and Hophni. They began to manipulate the situation. They began to abuse the entire process such that they would get the best parts of the meat, that they would have the first choice of the meat, that they would prepare and cook their meat how they like they had contempt for the offering of the Lord. And when people protest, we read this in the story, when people began to protest, they would say, we're going to take it by force. These men were bullies. They threw their weight around. They took what they wanted and they did what they pleased. And for that, we read in the text that God despised them and God had purposed to kill them. One commentator wrote this, the real sin surrounding the way the, the meat was uh, uh, cut and, 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 and cooked and distributed, the, the real sin was treating the sacrifice as if the key point was providing the share to the priests. The people's preference was violently overridden and God's strict requirement that the fat was to be burned was completely ignored. That's how this happened, these these priests refuse to acknowledge that when God's people bring of their resources into God's house, they are principally and chiefly giving a service to God. Now, the reason why I'm phrasing it like that is many of us have interacted with perhaps churches and preachers and pastors and ministers, or maybe not personally interacted, but we've seen it on the news or in news reports online. We've seen circumstances where this very kind of behavior is left unchecked, even in our day and age, where there is the, the sense of entitlement of the man who claims to be the representative of God, and the gifts and the giving and the, and the sacrificing to the house of God becomes all about them. I will have the first cut. I will have the best cut. I will take the majority. It's there to serve me. God despises that. God despises when people who claim to be agents of His grace, when ministers who claim to be servants of His will and His ways, turn that service into self-aggrandizement and self-serving. That's exactly what we see happening in the text. And it gets even more distasteful than that, because then we learn in the text that Hophni and Phinehas begin to engage in cultic prostitution. This is when, this is when Eli begins to rebuke them. And, and, and the truth be told, Eli's rebuke comes far too late in the game. Eli has dropped the ball insofar as raising his kids well and rightly. And yet he, he tries at least later in the piece to rebuke them. And it is revealed, it's revealed that these particular priests are engaging in cultic prostitution. We don't exactly know the parameters, but perhaps the best assumption that we get in the commentators and, and the scholars is that the way Hophni and Phinehas would, would set this up is, is when women would come to offer an offering, they would make the claim that by engaging in sexual relations with them was a form of service to God. I wish, I wish I could stand before you tonight and simply state to you that I've never encountered a situation that is like that in this day and age. But the truth of the matter is simply this. This is far more prevalent than you are probably even remotely aware of. This form of abuse, 
abusing the vulnerable, taking advantage of the weak and the needy in times of their need. Hophni and Phinehas now become, now become something of the icons of the, the worst possible ministers there could be to take advantage of women in their time of greatest vulnerability and to promise them all of God's riches and blessings and favor if only they would indulge them in their sexual fantasies. It is horridly grotesque and it is not foreign in our day, in age. Again, the contrast is becoming glaringly obvious. Samuel, quiet, humble, dutiful, loving the Lord and faithful in service. Hophni and Phinehas, grotesque, reprobate, depraved men who will stop at nothing to get what they want when they want it. Not only that, but if we could add another sin to their already elongated rap sheet, it would be this. Their utter disregard for their father's admonition. Now, I said earlier that I believe, and I, I don't think you can read 1 Samuel chapter 2 and escape this conclusion. I believe Eli has, has dropped the ball. Eli may have been a great priest. I, I believe he was. Eli may have been a faithful servant of God. I, I, I believe wholeheartedly that he was. But what Eli was not was a good father. The rebuke of Eli, tragically, comes far too late. But yet he does. Nonetheless, he takes his sons aside, he draws them in his crosshairs, and he says to them, you men ought to be rebuked and ashamed and repentant. But we read this in verse 25. Another sin, as I said, to the rap sheet of these already depraved men. These are the words of Samuel. Verse 25, if someone sins against a man, God will mediate for him. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? And then we read the conclusion of the matter. But they would not listen to the voice of their father, for it was, for it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. This is the most dire of all circumstances. This is the most tragic of all circumstances. When the very church, now I know we're speaking of the tabernacle in, in Old Testament times, but, but allow me to reference this as the church or draw the parallel with the modern church today. When the church compromises to such a degree, there is almost no reeling it back. We, we read in the story that a prophet is unnamed. We, we don't know his name, this, this prophet. We don't know whether he was a, a lifelong prophet or maybe, maybe this just was the, the single only occasion where God would give him this word. But it, if you'll go with me again to 2 Samuel chapter 2, we see that now entering upon the scene is this man of God. It's this prophet who comes to bring a word of clarity and condemnation. Pick it up at verse 27. And there came a man of God to Eli and said to him, thus says the Lord, thus says the Lord. Now the opening portion of this prophecy from the man of God is the man of God begins to detail why Eli and his sons are in the privileged position of the priesthood at all. Because God visited Aaron, their, their forefather, and, and God bestowed upon that family lineage the, the privilege of serving in God's house. The privilege, the, the high, the lofty privilege of serving God vocationally. So the Lord says through his servant, the prophet, I visited your family while you were still under the bondage of the house of Egypt, and I called you out. I chose him from all the tribes of Israel to be my priest. But there is a scorning of sacrifice. There is a scorning of the offering. And the Lord says, far be it from me, far be it from me to keep your family in this cherished position forever if you cannot in the least maintain faithfulness and morality in the position that you've been called. The Lord then declares to Eli the plan, the plan to utterly bankrupt the family for successive generations. The plan to take his family out of the priesthood. The plan that their family would be, would be, so, would, would be so lost that they would have diseases in their family, they would be impoverished as a family, and in fact, no one would even reach old age. 
that throughout the successive generations of his family, it would be seen that the majority die in middle age and did not even see the years of their old age. This is fairly staggering. We learn a few things out of this. The first observation that we should take from this is there is, just like we see in the story of Esau, there is a real and true selling of the birthright. Hophni and Phinehas, for some extra portions of choice meat and, and, and some fleeting sexual liaisons with some vulnerable women, for just that, and yes, it is just that, they sell the whole family out of the priesthood. They abandon all of the hope that God had for this lineage of people. Now, obviously, Hophni and Phinehas were in prime position to become Eli's heirs, God's agents, and Israel's judge. They were in the prime place. Here's Samuel in the wings. Samuel over here. Samuel. The boy born from the barren woman. The boy, the boy who's adopted by the priest family. The, the quiet boy. The, the boy that has nothing more than his basic needs met. But yet he loves the Lord and he serves the Lord. Here, here's Samuel. And as God will raise up Samuel to be, of course, prophet and judge, Hophni and Phinehas will lose. They sold this opportunity for some choice cuts of meat and illicit sex. They go down in history as the worst of all losers. And Eli, Eli lives with the disgrace of failing to raise his sons in the discipline and admonition of the Lord. The rebuke truly is sickening in its extent. Basically, you're all going to die on the same day. And they do. As we trace the, the story in 1 Samuel, we're going to come to this occasion where Israel is, is, is at war with, with, with the Philistines and is not doing well. It occurs to them, some harebrained idea to, to get the Ark of the Covenant, to bring it to the front lines of the battle. Hophni and Phinehas are going to carry the Ark all the way to the, to the battle. They're, they're going to be soundly beaten in the battle. The Ark's going to be stolen. Hophni and Phinehas killed. And later that day when Eli hears the news that the Ark has been stolen by the enemies of Israel, he falls off the back of his chair, breaks his neck, and dies. It all comes to pass. On the very same day, they're all going to utterly lose entirely, even their lives. Their descendants will be beggars. The priestly class will be shifted sideways to Ithamar's brother, Eleazar, the son of Aaron. Don't worry, it's still descendants of Aaron, but a different family line. And no one in the family will outlive middle age. There's a positive aspect to the prophecy. The Lord says, I will raise up a priest for me who will in fact do what my heart and my mind desire. Commentators believe that that priest is probably in the immediate sense, Zadok, who served as priest under David, the anointed king. He will become the Lord's faithful priest. He shall do according to what the Lord has in his heart and his mind. And the Lord will build him a sure house. He will go in and out before the anointed forever. Now that's in the immediate sense. But of course you, as Bible believing, spirit filled, Christ exalting Christians, it's hard to read that and not all of a sudden get a sense of the Lord is speaking more transcendentally about the one true final priest that God's people will have who is of course Jesus the Christ. Jesus will say of, you, of his own self, Jesus will declare, I do nothing that I don't see the Father doing. I say nothing that I don't hear the Father saying. Everything I do, everything I say is because the Father leads me to do and to say, Jesus will be the perfect high priest. And in a greater sense than that, and here's where the gospel takes on its unique hue, its glorious tone, its brilliant color. In, greater, in a greater sense than that, Jesus is not only the final, the greatest high priest that Israel and God's people shall ever have. He is all those things because the sacrifice that Jesus brings 
before God is no longer a lamb. It's no longer a bull, a goat, a dove, grain, or whatever the case may be. But we know that Jesus brings to the sacrificial altar of his father himself. He lays down his own life. He surrenders it all. He counts not equality with God a thing to be grasped, but humbles himself. Humbles himself to the point of a servant. And then even further to the point of death. Even death on a cross. But that now God has highly exalted him. This Jesus the Christ. God has exalted him. And granted him to have the name which is above every name. So that every single knee shall bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And God's people said, Amen. There's some practical application to this story. In fact, there's... There's so much that it really is a sermon series in and of itself. But let's draw out a few points. A few obvious ones at least. Sin will always cost you more than you're willing or even aware you'll pay. Do you wonder if, if, if Hophni and Phinehas had ever, just, had ever just been alerted to the fact that their, that their lustful rendezvous and, and, their, and their gluttony... It, if it would produce generations of poverty, generations of premature death, generations of, of loss and despair, do, do you think they might recalculate their need for the best cut of meat? To us, as we, as we read the book, and, and you, hear, you hear me say this so often, we, we read the Bible, and one of the best things about the Bible, I mean, everything about the Bible is the best thing, don't get me wrong, but one of the best things about the Bible is it paints humanity in its true color. It doesn't pull punches. It doesn't gloss over. It, it doesn't try and paint pictures in, 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 a, in a way that doesn't feel real. This story feels real. But another thing that the Bible does is it often gives us the end to the stories, the conclusion to the matter. Now, we don't often in our life necessarily get to experience all of the consequence and the ramifications for our sin, but as we read these chapters of this book, we're going to see time and time and time again these sins of these depraved fools returning and returning and returning. It's staggering to think the debt that we open ourselves up to on account of fleeting pleasure. Sin will always cost you more than you are aware you'll have to pay and always more than you're ever willing to pay. Here's the, here's the big idea. And I don't know what particular sin you're wrestling with right now in your life. I don't know what kind of sin is just continually knocking at your door and tempting you to succumb to. I don't know. But one thing I know beyond any shadow of a doubt is it is never worth it. Never. Generations, successive generations. Hophni, Phinehas, your sin costs your entire family line the priesthood. Your sin cost your entire family line long life. Your sin cost your entire family line even the ability to eat satisfyingly at all. The prophet said, the only people that will be left are the people who will weep their eyes out. Don't think for a moment that your sin won't also come attached with it such diabolical consequences. Please, don't ever think small thoughts of sin. The next, and I believe equally compelling and obvious application, we'll close out with this thought here this evening. Sin unchecked. Sin unchecked can and often will become generational. Can and often will become generational. I don't know about you, but knowing that I'm a father, that I'm raising children, I want them to be holier than me. 
I want them to love the Lord more than I do. I, I want them to serve Jesus in greater capacities than, than I do. That doesn't mean I'm forcing any of my kids into the ministry or anything like that. I just, I just want them to do better than, than I have. But you know what we continually confront in the Scriptures? Is this constant reminder. Is this constant reminder that where one generation draws the line, the next takes a step over. And successive generations will throw themselves headlong over that line. Think, think of David and David's weakness. D David's weakness with, with power and his weakness with women and his weakness with these kinds of temptations that he didn't always, he wasn't always successful over. Think about David and then, then his sons. How, how constantly they, they warred in much greater ways than he ever did, but yet with the same sins. So this is the application. That sin unchecked often becomes generational. The sins that you might tolerate, the little ones, the little indulgences, the, the, the peccadillos as we call them, the, the, the little indulgences that, that we know are not really according to God's will, but when, we're not that zealous to, to cut out and sever and, and excise from our life. Those sins that we tolerate, it is often true that our children will engage excessively in. This is going to be a constant reminder. This is not only going to be the application right now, friend. This is going to be the application all the way through the story of 1 Samuel. You know what is, you know what is just so challenging? We're going to see this in a few chapters. Is that Samuel is going to have kids. Samuel is going to be a dad. It's great. And you know what's going to happen to Samuel's kids? They're going to be raised... Just about as wicked as Hophni and Phinehas. This is, this is to me so staggeringly confronting. That as parents, some of us are brand new. Some of us are not yet parents. Some of us, some of us are kind of past that chapter of our life. And now we're exercising influence as grandma and grandpa or aunt and uncle, however that works in your family. But here's the staggering reality. That as Eli fails with his sons... And then Eli tries again with Samuel. And then Samuel has sons and Samuel's sons fail. Please don't misunderstand me tonight. I'm not saying that every time your kids fail and mess up and sin, it's on you. I'm not saying that. I wouldn't dare say that. That's foolish. But I think the reminder, I think the injunction, I, I, I think the scripture wants us to bear the weight of this burden that as parents, we have a grave duty toward our children to fight the sin in our life with a vicious savagery. If we can't do it for our own souls, at least do it for theirs. Sin unchecked often becomes generational. Often becomes generational. We have a heart. We have a desire. We have a compulsion to love our children and to want the best for them. My honest conviction, I'll leave you with this as we close out here together this evening. My honest conviction is simply this, that sometimes, in fact, no, often, the best thing you can ever give your kids is your holiness. It's your Christ-likeness. As they see that, they model that, they love that, they relish that, they celebrate that. Let's be mindful of how often in the Scripture we see a principle playing out through generational fallenness and sin. But ultimately, ultimately, our hope is in this. Let me read this verse again, verse 35. In fact, while I do this, why don't you bow your head and close your eyes so that I'm reminded we should be closing and praying. We read in verse 35, the Lord... The Lord gives this declaration, this prophetic word. They will become a Lord's faithful priest. The Lord's faithful priests shall do according the Lord. This is the Lord's words, verse 35. According to what is in my heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house. And he shall go in and out before my anointed forever. That when, we, when we're confronted with these realities, I, I don't know exactly about you, but 
But I know sometimes we, we think about our parenting, we think about the sins that we tolerate, we, we realize that we've been enjoying, indulging in certain sins and not thinking of them as we, as we probably should, that there could be a real sense of overwhelming guilt. I don't, I don't want that. I don't think that's helpful, and I don't think the gospel leads us to that place. I think there is occasion for repentance, there is occasion for reproof, there is occasion for rebuke, but I don't think as Christians there is occasion for a sense of overwhelming guilt when we look to the high priest that God has sent. That all of our sins, charged against Christ, punished in Christ on the cross as His shed blood every day cleanses us and provides us with new mercy. We will fail. We do fail. We often aren't all that we're cracked up to be. We're often not all that we are called to be. But Christ is sufficient. How we read this and we learn from this is to call out to God to give us grace to be stronger, to be more Christ-like, and to be more holy. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this reminder. We thank you for this reminder in this, in this chapter as we, as we encounter these reprobate men, these abusive, manipulative men who just do whatever it takes to get what they want. Father, you know, sometimes, sometimes, Father, we can be like that. And we don't want to be confronted with that reality. But, Father, I think your spirit through your word would, would in this moment make us aware that too often we think too little of our sin. We, we think small thoughts. We devalue the, the reality of, of our sin. And, Father, I want your spirit to do the work that only your spirit can do, which is to reveal to us your righteousness and our need of you. We can't be holy enough to please you. We can't be righteous enough to appease the demands of your law. But we can only come to Christ with the empty hand of faith. We can admit failure. We can pray for grace and strength to renew our mind and conviction to holiness. But Father, at the end of the day, in the final analysis, our claim must be purely and ultimately Christ. We plead the blood, Father. We plead the blood, not of a bull, not of a goat, not of a dove. We, in this instance, plead that blood of heaven's lamb, the highest of high priests, Jesus Christ, who on that cross died to forgive, to save, to cleanse us, and rose victorious to reconcile us. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you that there's wisdom here in this passage, that we would would learn vital lessons about how to live out our lives in light of gospel hope. Help us, grant us strength, and do all this, Father, for the glory of your name. In Jesus' name, amen.